Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to this session. The annual Dutch Theatre Festival has this tradition of being uh, inaugurated every year with a widely attended public lecture. And this lecture is titled The State of the Theatre. In 2018, Shukri Benshika, a Belgian Flemish scholar performer who was chosen to give this lecture, announced to a full hall in the majestic municipal city theater of Amsterdam at the end of his lecture that he would set himself on fire. His lecture addressed the urgency for theater makers to stop merely commenting and reflecting on the problems of the world while remaining safely within the bubble of the theater industry, calling upon them to start intervening in the world. At the moment when he announced that he would immolate himself as a first possible, first possible step in that radical direction, the rumble in the audience became palpable. Benchika picked up a jerry can, which he had ostentatiously placed next to the lectern at the start of the lecture. He walked to the front of the stage and he doused himself with the liquid. During the seconds while all this was playing out, in front of an increasingly worried audience, one spectator, who happened to be a, a senior, well-known theater personality himself, got up from his seat and shouted, stop! And he marched up to the podium, exclaiming, this is not nice, not even as a joke. And then he physically pushed Benchika, uh, urging him to leave the stage, which incidentally he was in the process of doing on his own anyway. Benchika's last lines as he exited the stage were, does anyone have a lighter? This lecture performance by Benchika, the intervention of the audience member, and all that played out after it ended, were the subject of much discussion in the Dutch and Flemish theater circuits for the next weeks, as you can imagine. Was it actually petrol that the, he had doused himself with? One online commentator said he was so outraged that if it would really have been petrol, he would file a police report against Ben Shikha for incitement to violence, for disturbing the public peace. And another replied that if it was only water, then it would be an equally cheap prank. And Ben Shikha deserved to be reprimanded for raising false alarms and insulting the audience. Why play with the emotions of the audience? So the argument went just to make a stale old point about theater's lack of political impact which is a lament as old as theater history itself. Theater ought not to be reduced to site for stunts, political stunts. So for some, the interruption of a lecture performance by a staged or a real threat of self-immolation was a frivolous tactic. And for others, including myself, it was a gesture of purposeful interruption a clever use of tactical frivolity to, to urge us to be both circumspect as well as hopeful about the political potentials of theater and performance. It wasn't difficult to recognize the theatrical framing of Ben Shikha's lecture performance. All along, a volunteer was seated in the wings of the stage with a fire extinguisher close at hand, a scenographic conjuring of the imminent possibility of fire, but also an instance of law and order authorized to interrupt the performance at any moment if public health and safety were endangered. Anyone could have wondered why she needed to be positioned so glaringly visible to all if it was just about adhering to fire and safety regulations. Before Ben Shika picked up the jerry can and poured the liquid on himself, he curiously proceeded to take off his white designer shoes, as if at least these precious consumer objects of desire should be spared the sacrifice. As for the jerry can, if you imagine this plastic object, yellow plastic object stood out as a very odd accessory right from the moment he entered on the stage, unbefitting the occasion of such a prestigious and formal event, such as the annual State of the Theater Lecture. An even more obvious 
was his closing line, asking the audience for a lighter, ironically placing the responsibility on others to start the fire, and thus turning his threat into someone else's burden. In the end, instead of setting himself on fire, Ben Shikha had in fact drenched himself with water without even wetting his shoes. Yet, although there were enough signs to recognize that this was just a performance, the speech act of declaring that he would set himself on fire, along with the acts that followed, no matter how symbolic, no matter how self-referential, they had a, a force, an elocutionary force that left the audience fairly perplexed. It wasn't a coincidence that he left the stage and did not return for the usual round of applause, another breach of theatrical convention that further confounded the straightforward framing of the situation as a performance in a conventional theater space. And my own bafflement as an audience member grew with what happened right after the lecture performance was over. The moderator of the evening appeared on the stage uh, proclaiming the next item on the program which was the announcement of a BNG Bank-sponsored theater award. <laughs> as if nothing had happened. As if this was just a change of a television channel. As if the call of uh, Benshika's call underlying the annual State of the Theater lecture was just uh, an annoying interruption to what was determined to remain an undisturbed festive occasion. And in the meantime, stage hands uh, mopped, dried the stage in preparation for another performance later that evening. And the evening proceeded as scheduled. The awards were announced, the theater festival was declared open, and the absurdity of the situation couldn't have been more painfully apparent. For all his passionate critique of the insensity of the art world and the need to step out of the cage, what followed Ben Shika's lecture performance was evidence of the very same business as usual approach, which he was reproaching. So this lecture performance of uh, Shokri Ben Shikha offers me the opportunity to reflect on this curious phenomenon of interruption in the theater. We can begin by distinguishing between conventionally accepted modes of interruption and interruptions that are not sanctioned by convention. Theater stages are accustomed to receiving material, verbal tokens of disapproval from their discontent audiences. A poor performance may receive vocal expressions of dissatisfaction. Audiences behaving boisterously, <laughs> boos, hoots. In some popular performance traditions, it's not uncommon for artists especially those performing solo numbers, to face audience disapproval in the form of rotten tomatoes and eggs, paper planes and other objects being thrown at them. Could be, this could be regarded as the negative counterpart to being showered with cash, with flowers, generous applause, shouts of praise for a skilled performance which are positively con connoted and therefore not considered to be interruptions. Oftentimes, these interruptions are no cause for alarm as they form part of accepted conventions. They serve as barometers of audience responses. Performers are expected to be prepared to respond to them gracefully and to try to do a better job as artists. But where the interruption is unexpected and not an accepted convention, it presents a more complicated situation. The immediate response to the pelting of objects on stage or other unsolicited interventions in a proscenium stage performance is usually foregrounded with security arguments. Unruly audience members are ushered out of the hall. They are reprimanded, they are fined for disturbing the show. Reviewers will click their tongues at those who disregard the sacred conventions of the art space. But once the wider debates are initiated, once the people care to ask what purpose the inter interruption has served, 
And if the protesters' demands ought to be taken seriously, such disruptive gestures, or indeed the artists to whom they are addressed, may, become, may even become hallmark moments of, or figures of theater history. The phenomenon of the interruption of a stage performance can be motivated by a wide range of ideological political positions. So just the act of throwing an object on a stage as a marker of disapproval seems to cut across traditional political divides. It's to be found on both the left and the right sides of the spectrum, as it were. It's targeted at both politically so-called progressive as well as conservative performance forms. There are numerous examples of performances by renowned theater makers which are subject to attacks by groups who raise objections to the performance's content, to its message, to its dramaturgical choices, to its depiction of certain figures. And there are equally numerous examples of activist attacks targeted at the theater as a form of institutional critique, as a creative tactical disruption in order to draw public attention to a specific cause. In the Netherlands, a well-known example of this is the so-called tomato incidents in the, uh, in, the, in the 1970s, which began with a group of protesters disrupting a performance in the municipal theater in Amsterdam by pelting the performers with tomatoes. So tomatoes or eggs can be the signs of audience disapproval, but as signs, they need to be read and interpreted with attention to the specificity of their context. So I think it's not that useful to distinguish between or judge these differently motivated interruptions only according to their political or ideological views. This is not to claim that these distinctions do not matter. In fact, quite the contrary. Obviously, it matters if the interruption is a form of speaking truth to power or an act of censorship, whether it's done from top down or bottom up. But leaving aside the questions of who is being offended and interrupted, for what reason, and whether or not we feel it's justified, I think it's useful to reflect on the significance of interruption as a phenomenon in performance. Not least because we are witnessing and living through a pandemic interruption to the performing arts, which is proving to be anything but a brief inconvenience. So although it might sound like a counterintuitive suggestion, interruption is actually quite central to theater theory. <clears throat> if I speak with Adrian Keir, one could argue that theater itself is a kind of artful interruption of ordinary time. So when is interruption important? How should we be paying attention to the ways in which it occurs? Under which conditions might interruption be deemed political? In searching for answers to these questions, I want to think through two scenes of interruption. The first is from Walter Benjamin's essay on Brecht, and the second is from Louis Althusser's study on ideology. Um, in the ways that these philosophers are presenting and reflecting on the scenes, the relation between performance and politics becomes one of mutual influence, of co-constitution. They reveal that they are not watertight compartments. So it's not just that theater is a metaphor for describing the political, or that political, the political is not just a theme that is depicted on stage, but they are inter intertwined in their modalities in complex ways. So the first scene, is taken from an essay by the philosopher Walter Benjamin on Bertolt Brecht's epic theater. In Bertolt Brecht's conception, the spectator's immersion in a scene must be interrupted by various means. In order to stimulate the spectator's critical distancing and disidentification with the scene and the character portrayed on stage. Walter Benjamin writes quite eloquently about this. Benjamin argues that in Brechtian epic theater, it's not so much about mimetically depicting or reproducing a situation, but rather about revealing the conditions underlying a situation. 
using various means and techniques of interruption from stage design, music, punctuation, and the actor's gestures. gestures. So far from ruining its enjoyment, Benjamin points out that the interruption of a scene actually brings about a keen awareness of a specific situation, a sense of rapture in the spectator. So just as the sports enthusiast can remain engrossed in a game, simultaneously be cheering, hooting, commenting on the player's moves, or a late radio listener can switch on and off, move in and out of the radio show with ease. Similarly, Benjamin imagined the audiences of Brecht's epic theater as participants engrossed in a scene while simultaneously uh, aware of its conditions and circumstances from a distance. He brings in a curious example to elaborate how such an interruption could bring an ongoing scene to a standstill to enrapture it and to dynamize it. I'm quoting from Benjamin now. Take the crudest example, a family row. Suddenly, a stranger comes into a room. The wife is just about to pick up a bronze statuette and throw it at the daughter. The father is opening the window to call a policeman. At this moment, the stranger appears at the door. Tableau, as they used to say around 1900. That is to say, the stranger is confronted with a certain set of conditions, troubled faces, open window, a devastated interior, end of quote. So for Benjamin, the interruption is intriguing in the way that it leaves not only the stranger, but all the figures in the scene wondering what will happen next? What happened before that led to the scene? What's actually going on over here? What are the larger purports of the scene? The stranger is confronted with a scene that apparently grinds to a halt. It calls upon everyone concerned to piece together the, the parts of the puzzle. And Benjamin's curious case of the family row was intended as a scene that crystallizes the principles of Brechtian epic theater. The audience, not unlike the stranger, is faced with a situation of both intense identification, immersion, as well as disidentification. This is precisely what the Brechtian justice uh, refers to in Benjamin's interpretation of the domestic scene. It's not just the outward expression of an inner feeling or attitude, as the common English usage of the term gesture might indicate, but it's rather an interruption of this bringing together of the inner and outer worlds. In Samuel Weber's reading of Benjamin's, uh, Benjamin, Gestus is, and I quote from Weber here, is not the fulfillment or realization of an intention, but rather its disruption, its suspension. It entails not so much expression as interruption, and it is this that makes it eminently theatrical. End of quote. So gestures calls situations into being. It brings their smooth movement to a halt. It, uh, by, and it, 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 it makes the contradictions in a situation perceptible by interrupting any assumed direct link between inner feeling and outer expression. In Brecht's thinking of uh, epic theater, uh, this generativity of gestures was essential means to achieving the Pfeffrendung's effect, that effect of disidentification uh, defamiliarization. Gestus is the kind of arresting of movement, the arresting of any possible identification with meanings and associations attached to the movement in order to be able to lay bare the inconsistencies and to make a scene perceptible in all its details. So similarly also in the, if I return to the scene of uh, Ben Shikhar, a lecture performance, his gesture of dousing himself with a liquid simultaneously also ends and it dislocates the scene at a, at a kind of disconcerting moment. So there is this gestural contingency uh, and the theater becomes the exemplary, the privileged site for an operation of power to become perceptible. But at the same time, the full manifestation of the operation of power is paradoxically displaced elsewhere. It's outside the conventional institutions, 
and platforms of the theater, in its backstages, in its rehearsal spaces, on the streets, in public squares, in parliament, in the workplace, all these sites that form the interface of performance and politics. I turn now to another scene of interruption in philosophy, namely to an example in Louis Althusser's study, Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses, wherein he presents his concept of interpolation. So Althusser uses this scene as a kind of theoretical theater. It's a hypothetical scene through which he elaborates his concept of interpolation. Um, and the idea is that it allows certain philosophical problems to be identified from singular situations and moments and general principles to be extrapolated from that uh, singular moment. The scene in brief is a tableau vivant presenting the moment a policeman calls out or hails someone on the street. Hey, you! And this person feeling that it is them being summoned, responds to the call by turning around. In this act of turning to the police, the person recognizes themselves as a subject of the law. So for Althusser, this is the process of interpolation where one recognizes oneself as a subject. In the police practice of hailing, Hey, you there! hey, you there, the subject views themselves as what they think the police think they are. Similar to Walter Benjamin's scene or domestic, scene of domestic conflict, Althusser presents here an everyday situation in terms of a scenic structure, thereby enlarging it through a microscope and enabling a distanced observation and recognition of un the underlying mechanisms at work. Interpolation in French is derived from the Latin interpolare, to interrupt by speaking, and refers in one of its meanings to a person being intercepted in public by an instance of authority, stopped in their tracks and singled out from a crowd, and being required to identify themselves. Was it me the police was summoning? Did I do something wrong? In this scene of encounter, the individual gives account of themselves to the law and in doing so recognizes themselves as a subject. For Althusser, therefore, the scene is a condensation of two processes, the process of subjectivation, that is becoming a subject, and the process of subjection, the process of being made a subject. Interpolation is thus not synonymous with hailing. It's the staging of the hailing as an act of interruption by the law or by, by other ideological state apparatuses. And it's accompanied by the turning of the head an acknowledgement of being the, the one being hailed. The scene allows Althusser to concretize the functioning of ideology and to demonstrate that the relation, the state and its subject share, share not only a legal or a territorial relationship, but also a psychic one, marked by ideology. A state recruits its subjects, not only through law enforcement institutions and agents like the police and the courts, but equally, and more importantly in our case, in a far more heterogeneous and decentralized manner through so-called ideological state apparatuses like schools, religious bodies, the institution of the family, uh, the media and art institutions such as the theater. These ensure that the individuals as subjects are compliant with and subjugate themselves to the terms of the state by willingly believing that their position within the state and its structures is the obvious and the natural one. Althusser argued that through these ideological state apparatuses, subjects are hailed into being Individuals come to recognize themselves as subjects through being interpolated. So Althusser uses the scene of interruption to make the point that there is no vantage point outside of ideology. Because as he points out, uh, and quote from Althusser, the existence of ideology and the interpolation of individuals as subjects are one and the same thing, end of quote. 
This implies that ideology is not first an idea in abstraction that's subsequently inserted into or translated into subjects, but that ideology comes to existence through the very material practices of the subjects and not outside of them. Ideology is therefore the unity of idea and action. Ideas in action, he argues, kind of citing Antonio Gramsci. And in developing this argument, Althusser uh, refers to an aphorism by Blaise Pascal, the 17th century mathematician and mystic philosopher. Um, and this aphorism says, kneel down, move your lips in prayer, and you will believe. Implying that it's not necessarily the belief that exists first, taking on, which then takes on the form of religious rituals and acts, but equally the act of kneeling down in church or in, in prayer, moving one's lips in prayer through which one becomes, but it's through this act that one becomes interpolated as a believer, as a subject of the ideological apparatus of religion. So Althusser's scene of the police summoning thus alerts us to what he terms the material and what theater and performance scholars might term the embodied, the performed manifestation of ideology. <laughs> outlined a number of scenes of interruption so far. First, I spoke of uh, Shokri Ben Shikha's interruption of his own lecture performance with his staged threat of self-immolation, which was in turn interrupted by a member of the audience. Second, I, had, I gave a general reflection on the uh, conventional accepted forms of interruption in performance which don't necessarily function as disruptions because they are recognizable uh, in terms of the rules of the art world. Um, and third, I refer to Walter Benjamin's scene of a stranger's sudden appearance interrupting a domestic conflict situation. And finally, I refer to Althusser's scene of interpolation. So what fascinates me in all this is how interruption in the context of artistic performance signals not only a break in the continuity of what is happening on stage, but that through this temporary dislocation, the stage or podium is somehow extended to another site, to the street, to the public square, to, uh, and we might rudimentarily call this uh, the realm of the political. At the same time, an interruption in the realm of everyday life, such as the ones depicted in the scenes of Walter Benjamin and Althusser, an interruption there has the potential to become a highly performative moment. The artist striving to be politically effective seeks to step out of the theater. Yet, an ordinary moment in everyday life becomes political when it is interrupted by the protocols of performance. 
so what do I mean by political here? I hope uh, I will be forgiven for trying to reinvent a wheel. I use the political here not in the sense of parliamentary politics, not elections, not all that, but as a kind of practice that seeks to overcome the status quo, that a transformative and formative practice. So regardless of the definition of politics, the political is to be found in its staging, in its material embodiment. So speaking with Althusser, uh, the political is the unity of ideas and action. But for it to be recognized, the unity needs to be interrupted. Let me explain what I mean by returning for a moment to Shokri Ben Shikha's uh, lecture performance. In this uh, presentation, he spoke eloquently about the urgent need for artists to transgress the limits and borders of artistic domains and extend the theater to sites external to the conventional theater hall, the public square, the classroom, the street. He called for theater and performance to take inspiration from historical figures such as Muhammad Bouazizi, the 26-year-old Tunisian fruit vendor whose public self-immolation in Tunisia in 2010 is regarded as the trigger for the surge of public uprisings that came to be known as the Arab Spring. Or Jan Palach, the Czech dissident whose self-immolation marked a turning point in the Prague Spring in 1969. These figures were inspirational, so Ben Shika claimed, because they understood that a revolution could be set ablaze only by turning themselves into a site of spectacle and self-sacrifice. Besides being another tongue-in-cheek pointer to the closing act of the lecture performance, the reference to these fig two figures as performers raises different questions. In what sense were Mohamed Bouazizi or Jan Palach performers? If it seems cruel and disingenuous to render their tragic acts of self-immolation as performance, it seems equally inappropriate to ask artists to mimic them and do as they do in the theater. At the same time, it could be argued, particularly with reference to Mohamed Bouazizi, that his act of self-immolation was not a political act. It was a spontaneous act of despair and outrage at the corruption of the government. It was not premeditated. It was not in the service of a political cause. Its status as a deeply political act is derived not from existing repertoires and conventions of political action, but from its symbolic power, from its incredible violence and self-harm, and from its having taken place in full public view in front of the government office. It became political because of its performative force. Political theorist Banu Bargu has suggested that this uh, act of self-immolation invites us to question the link between the agency of the individual and the moment movement of history. So the question is, what does it take for the course of history and for the status quo to be shattered by an act of a single person. Ben Shikha's performance is of another order. It becomes political in a paradoxical way. It, as it calls, us, calls on us to leave the theater in search of the theater. The paradox is most palpable, of course, in this moment of interruption when the lecture performance kind of condenses into a tableau. The performer who has just doused himself with a liquid and declared, or some would say threatened, that he will set himself on fire, creates an interruption in the conditions that guarantee the suspension of disbelief, the smooth mechanism of theatrical activity. It's an interruption to the extent that it portends no longer to remain a staged scripted scene. No wonder then that the audience member uh, was compelled to also interrupt the scene and prevent 
what they feared may turn into an act of self-destruction in the guise of radical performance. Yet, as the performer leaves the stage, leaving the audience with the burden of that question, does anyone have a lighter? The, at that moment, the scaffolding, the conventions of the theater world were laid bare. They became visible and observable. So even though it was scripted and Ben Shika did not set himself on fire, the gesture is nonetheless consequential. It bears a performative force that is derived from its paradoxical closeness to and distance from actual acts of self-immolation. It gives the audience a glimpse, however tentative, however stylized, of what it might be like to witness such an act, which for most people is, of course, only accessible through mediatized news reports. It simultaneously stretches the boundaries of the theater, bringing into relief its, the frameworks at its edges, the infrastructures that enable its working and keep its mechanary, imaginary mechanisms intact. The question, does anyone have a lighter, is thus a kind of interpolation in the way that Althusser form formulated it. To respond to Ben Shikha's call is to bear some form of responsibility, which cannot be sh shed just because it's a performance that at some point will come to an end. The, the audience is thus bound to the scene in a volatile impasse. It's made co-responsible for abetting or even witnessing an attempted act of arson, uh, self-immolation, or mm, harming a person and committing an act of arson. The impasse is, however, uniquely generative because the closing gesture leaves an act unfinished, thus placing upon the audience the task of imaginative completion leaving contingent the possibility of a different ending in the future. Ben Shikha's lecture performance is a scene of interruption where the steaming, seemingly stable boundary between the theater as art institution and the theater as a site of political practice is destabilized. But perhaps it also shows us that theater's unique potential lies in its capacity to be dislocated, to be displaced and moved to the public square, to the streets, to the parliament, to refugee camps, to the classroom. Ben Shikha's risky play with self-immolation may have ended with a reassurance to the audience that, after all, there is no fire on the stage. Yet. It also simultaneously left the audience with a kind of eerie recognition that somewhere something is on fire and that it's not the theater that will extinguish it. In her study on temporality and its relationship to history, theater scholar Maurya Wickstrom recognizes how fire in relation to performance is often deployed, usually metaphorically, but sometimes also literally, to signal the interruption of history as processionism, that is, history as linear progression. Fire, even the signaling of the possibility of fire, allows for an interruption in our experience of time. It gestures the imminent mythical possibility of riot, of unrest, of uncontrolled outcomes. It's a weapon of the disenchanted that threatens to raise the ideological apparatus of the theater. The fire in Ben Shika's lecture performance is staged as literal, but it is sim simultaneously interrupted and thus deliteralized. The threat that the fire represents can obviously be interpreted in many ways. The self-inflicted destabilization, decentering of the theater in terms of its place and relevance in the world, a kind of institutional self-critique, uh, a kind of recognition of the audience in being interpolate, interpolated as critical but nonetheless bourgeois liberal art enthusiasts and thus as paralyzed political subjects. I am trying now uh, all this while to grapple with how and under which circumstances interruption in performance might be a generative form of participation and serve as a case in point for examining the interfaces of politics and performance. 
I must make it clear that I do not claim that interruption in itself is radical or counter-hegemonic. Very often it isn't. Nor do I advocate a conceptualization of it as a technique that can be implemented as a political tool regardless of context. Rather, I'm arguing that in taking interruption seriously and accounting for it politically, that is, as a practice of transforming the status quo, it becomes important to pay attention to the material details of a scene of interruption, to scale down the action to gestures, to images, tableau vivants, to scenographic details. In the process of examining a number of scenes of interruption, moving in and outside the domain of theatrical performance, imaginary scenes, theatrical scenes, theoretical scenes, the practices and acts of interruption drew me toward the political concepts of ideology and interpolation and uh, defamiliar, defamiliarization. Intriguingly, these concepts are elaborated by political theorists or philosophers as theatrical scenes. I find that fascinating. But uh, the point really that I've been trying to make is that the political dimensions of the scenes are not restricted to the realm of ideas, but they are bound to their materiality and their embodiment. I look forward to discussing all this with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>